Okay, let's begin. Welcome everybody to our eighth public lecture of this new academic year. We hold these talks every Thursday at 5 p.m., both in person in a huge room to allow for social distancing and via Zoom to allow for more remote engagement. As you can imagine, this entails its own challenges but also offers some new opportunities. Today, we meet entirely through Zoom because our speaker is joining us from his home in Hong Kong. Dr. Man Kong Wong is a visiting research fellow at the CSRS this year and is a professor of history at Hong Kong Baptist University, where he's been teaching since, I think, 1996 and where he has served as acting associate dean and the director of China studies. He has a long and distinguished publication record, both in English and Chinese. Just since 2017, in addition to publishing articles and essays, he's written or edited six books, including Hong Kong History, Themes in Global Perspective, Medical Services in Hong Kong and Christianity and Oral History, Instant in Season, Out of Season, the Chinese Church during the Civil War period, a documentary history of public health in Hong Kong, health policy and disease in colonial and post-colonial Hong Kong, between continuity and change, studies on the history of Chinese Christianity since 1949. That's quite an impressive list really in those, in those uh, last six years. Although I don't think his lecture will address indigenous issues, his focus on the role of missionaries in Asia reminds us of the many ways Europeans and North Americans engaged with other societies. We're all still trying to understand these engagements in the most rigorous manner possible. And so before I turn over the digital podium to Mankong Wong, I would like to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. So the format for today is that uh, Dr. Wong will offer us uh, a lecture and then we'll have an opportunity of about 15 minutes or so to have some conversation. If you uh, want to ask a question, you can do so in a couple of ways. You can pose the question in the chat box or you can raise your hand uh, digitally. Uh, I think our, our group will be uh, fairly intimate today and so it shouldn't be that difficult to do it that way. So we can play that by ear when the time comes. Okay, uh, Dr. Man Kong Wong, take it away. Good morning. Uh, oh, uh, good, af good afternoon, friends. Uh, here is uh, eight o'clock in the morning, Hong Kong time. Uh, so I just tend to say uh, how grateful I am uh, and thank you for putting me up in this uh, wonderful audience. Um, so um, today, uh, let me share the screen, uh, this one. Um, all right. I... Okay, good, good. Um, Geographically, Hong Kong is located at the southern tip of South China. If by train, the railway distance between Hong Kong and Beijing is more than 2000 kilometers. However, putting Hong Kong in the bigger picture of, bigger historical picture of Christian missions in China is a necessity. In the first place, missionaries were active in Hong Kong, considered themselves China missionaries. They look for and even create opportunities to reach out their influence and uh, in China. The reciprocal influences over the development of missionary medicine between Hong Kong and China were much more caudal than the geographical distance might have suggested. Today, I will talk about Dr. Gordon King and using his China career to review the subtle interconnectedness uh, uh, between China and Hong Kong in Christian contributions to medicine during World War II. In this PowerPoint slide, I show you a picture uh, 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 taken in 1935 when Hong Kong celebrates the silver jubilee of the King George V. And you can see that in the image, um, the dragon dance, of course, a very traditional Chinese way. But at the same time, when you look into the uh, pictures, you can see uh, some people dressed in white, wear a kind of a, a British style hats, you know, to celebrate. So I think that uh, vividly uh, uh, capture the historical image of Hong Kong, where East West interacts. Oops. Christian influence in the first half of 20th century China. Let me give you a background note. During the time frame of the first, 20, first half of 20th century, 
specifically from 1900 to 1945, the Christian influence in China was embodied in different scale and scope, going through changes repeatedly and unexpectedly. unexpectedly. The boxes and the Ensua fiasco marked the, uh, seeds, uh, uh, the height of the xenophobia uh, in China. Now, subsequently, China, however, underwent a two decades of a golden age of missionary movement that Daniel Bates, um, that Daniel Bates uh, uh, described as a golden age. And uh, he described, he qualified uh, this period, a, a, a rapid growth of Sino foreign Protestant establishment. Um, there were also waves of revivals in different locations and forms, being the results of the sterling emotionalism that was inspired by the seeming opposites of the usual power of pulpit teaching on the one hand and charismatic practices on the other hand. Besides uh, the May 4th movement and subsequently the anti-Christian movement inspired a gradual strengthening of a nationalistic notion of politics that defined a tighter control over Christian religion, such as registration of schools, uh, and replacing missionaries by Chinese in some leading positions within the church circles. In short, there were upside down and inside out changes in both missionary organizations and church institutions in the first 20th century in China. Christianity, however, was a rather stable factor in the development of medicine in China throughout these five decades in 20th century China. As revealed in this book, uh, Neither Donkey or No Horse, um, the first half of the 20th century saw the growth of biomedicine as the Chinese quest of modernity in the wake of such global health crisis as the Manchurian plague, as well as repositioning and reinventing the traditional Chinese medicine. Against this picture, of the two of these trends in the modern, uh, modern uh, medical history of modern China, missionary medicine deserve a special notice. Missionary medicine in the first place was very proud of making wonders of her surgeries, which the Chinese medicine um, did not, perhaps does not usually encourage. Uh, people like Peter Parker or John McKenzie, they won the confidence of the general public because of their skills in surgeries, uh, and most notably in curing eye disease, which were quite prevalent in China at that time. Um, it was of particular significance for two reasons. First, treating eye disease was relatively at a low risk. A patient suffering eye disease may have already suffered significant sight impairment. If failing an eye surgery, the worst outcome for the patient was the loss of sight that the patient might have already anticipated. As such, it did not provoke strong resistance. Second, it could have created a powerful conversion experience for Chinese patients, uh, likening it to uh, the likening to the biblical account of Saul's conversion to Paul the Apostle. To see is to be enlightened, both visually and spiritually. And other major aspect of missionary medicine was medical education. Like most form of the early, like most of the early form of education, medical missionaries tried out their own programs of apprentices with a few selected Chinese. But uh, as the missionaries medicine pro proved popular and Christian hospitals successful, some start their missionary uh, uh, medical college uh, with the help of funding, missionary funding, local donation, and foreign philanthropy, such as uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation. This picture, you see the Bucking Union uh, Medical College uh, was such an example. Um, at that time uh, in the, oh, oh, sorry, I just move on here. This development coincided with the growing acceptance of the germ theory of diseases and the rise of biomedicine. Dr. Wu Lian, the beautiful success in combating the Manchurian plague in 1910 was the most welcome testimony to the necessity of germ theory, a Methodist by church denomination 
coming from Benin of Mandaya, Dr. Wu was a Cambridge trained physician and started his medical career in the, at first in Singapore and Penang, later on Shanghai and North China. No one could dispute that the Western model of medical training was in need in China. Um, this Buckingham Union Medical College was a result of collaboration of Anglo-American missionary societies, such as London Mission Society and American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission uh, since 1908. Two years later, uh, our, uh, the, Funda the Rockefeller Foundation remodeled the college after the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. This college, uh, if we take uh, Daniel Bay's suggestion seriously, it could be uh, one of the best examples of the Sino foreign Protestant establishment. The medical missionary career of Gordon King Buckingham, Jinan, and Hong Kong. A word about his background is useful. He was born into and raised in a pious Christian family. Frederick King, his father, was a Baptist minister. At the very last phase of World War I, he was enlisted as a cadet officer of the Six Kings Liverpool Regiment. Trained at London Hospital Medical College from 1919, Gordon King was an award-winning student who secured prizes in autonomy, clinical pathology, pathology, clinical medicine, and disease of children. And he was qualified in 1924 as MRCS and LRCP. Subsequently, he pursued further studies and became the, uh, the fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, he joined the Baptist Missionary Society, BMS, that sent him to um, uh, Parking Union Medical College to teach gynecology. His performance was impressive and he became a foundational fellow of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 1932. The BMS later deployed him to take up the professorship and had the head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Chilu. A university, also known as Shandong Christian University, an institution that BMS was one of the founders. It was a key. Um, uh, it was a key. It was a, a key. Uh, which, uh, it was a key medical hospital uh, founded by missionaries. Gordon King's pathway to Hong Kong had not been anticipated had it not because of the Japanese invasion into Shandong. In a medical conference in, 19, in Canton, 1935, uh, the Dean of Medicine from Hong Kong U, William Gerard, given him a personal and cordial invitation uh, to come over Hong Kong U. He rejected the offer right away. Upon reflection, he writes, and I quote here, I did not even consider it then as I was extremely happy in work in Chilu and felt my place was there. In 1931, the Japanese Guangdong army occupied Manchuria. The, Jap the Chinese government tried to persuade the League of Nations to sanction on Japan, but to no avail. Gordon King and other missionaries were aware of the growing Japanese ambitions in China, yet they decided not to leave China. When he finished his uh, sabbatical in September 1937, knowing that Marco Polo bridge incident had already taken place two months ago, Gordon King chose to return to Chilu University. His wife and children, however, stayed behind in Britain. This suggested that he was not unaware of the threats and dangers. Upon his arrival, he met with waves of refugees taking the opposite directions of travel, leaving Jinan as rumors had it that the Japanese army would soon occupy the city and there were some forms of combats between the Japanese and Chinese at that time. He carried on his trip and reported duty to the university anyway. By the way, this is uh, the, the, the Chilu universities, uh, a diploma uh, offer. Uh, uh, a diploma, an MD diploma. 
um, in December 1937, the Japanese army occupied Jinan. Most students and faculty members had already left for Chengdu of Sichuan province, where they started over again the university. He kept the pledge of taking care of the university property and discharged his medical duties to healing the sick and injured people who sought treatment at the university hospital. By that time, Britain and Japan were still on good terms. Anglo-Japanese alliance, which had been introduced 1902 and renewed in 1922 were in place. The Japanese army did not at first cause much troubles to the British in China, but it came with frustration, annoyances, and everlasting compromises of trying to carry on under the Japanese regime in North China. To Gordon King, his primary call was to um, was to do was to engage in medical education. If not doable, there was no point for him to stay in Chilu, and he had this reflection in his private letter. He said, I felt that if our students were able to return to us and teaching would work were to open again in autumn, I should definitely stay on. We are hoping to start a pre-medical course in autumn, but that means four or five years before they will have reached the stage of requiring instructions in my subjects. From the teaching point of view, it looks as though my work in this line will be in abeyance and for a definite indefinite period. I wonder how far I should be justified in giving up work, this work to which I have devoted myself over ten, uh, 10 years now. Gordon King's interest in going to Hong Kong U was taking shape in June 1938, but there were twists and turns in this difficult decision. Religion played a role in the decision making process. In June, he declared, I feel that there would be very real opportunities for, for Christian services there. That means Hong Kong U. On the other hand, he was of the view that divine intervention would have a role, specifically articulate it as follow. If it is not God's will for me, I have a firm belief that God will make his way clear to me through the workings of the appointment committee. So I am pray, still praying and waiting for the guidance but in two weeks time, he made up his mind as he saw some unforeseeable developments. Both Philip Price and Lawrence Ingle were soon leaving their posting at Chilu. In collegial spirits, Gordon King did not want to leave his, um, this is yes, 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 his, uh, did not want to leave, uh, his colleague said Chilu, helpless, and he withdrew his case from Hong Kong U. He wrote, I put the quotation here, it would be a very severe blow to the hospital to lose both him and me at one fell swoop. swoop. Ingo and I are on now the only two here prepared to undertake major surgeries. And with Ingo going to fall off next year, the outlook would be very would be pretty bleak. My very great reluctance to severe the ties which bind me to Chilo and the BMS are of course factors which weigh me with me increasingly and all the time. So all in all, I have been driven the conclusion that there's only one course open to now, to me now, and this is to withdraw my application for the Hong Kong Post. But in another two weeks time, especially after the negotiation with the Japanese regime, it became crystal clear that Chilu was not allowed to start any course, pre-medical courses included. As such, Gordon King did not see his use, um, his use uh, in the delivery of medical education. On the other hand, his wife and children were not returning to Shandong for obvious safety reasons. His appointment case at Hong Kong U was reinstated. In September, he finally decided to move to Hong Kong U, where he was to become, uh, uh, where he was um, uh, become the chair of gynologists at the uh, at Hong Kong U. He was now able to present his case to the missionary uh, board as the circumstances made clearer to him. 
and he present these three quick, uh, reasons um, that I put on this PowerPoint. First, he believed that his main job is as a teacher is his own subject. Second, the prospect for several years, he will not be able to carry out his real job. And finally, he thought it was necessary for him to, re, to be reunited with his family. So he ended his letter with a polite victory. I shall hate to pull up the roots which have taken such a deep hole in Chilu. Furthermore, he remarks, I feel too that if I do go to Hong Kong for an agreed initial period of three years, the door would not be closed for my return to Chilu at the, at the end of the time. I, if I feel that there is a need here, which I could and ought to fill. One might argue that it was the usual writing strategies to save him from any accusation of running away from his responsibilities. Yet, there are two points here I want to stress. First, he made a substantial donation to the BMS that conveyed his sincere intentions to maintain his connections. Second, uh, his connection with missionary circle in China turned out to be a great assistance to his future uh, medical students studying at Hong Kong U. To Hong Kong, he went with a Christian imperative. It was evident in both of his formal resignation letters. One addressing to the medical advisors, the other, the foreign secretary of the BMS. In his, um, I, I put up, yes, I put up a, a two quotes here uh, that he wrote to the medical advisors. Uh, he said, I feel that the need for Christian men on the staff of a government university in Hong Kong is at least as great as a university in Chilo. He also shares a sense of continuity in upholding the missionary seal that you would see in the very last quotation here. Um, the BMS was receptive to Gone King's sincere letters. In return, it made a friendly dress gesture, giving a favor that um, King had not asked for. The official letter, I quote here, oops, the committee members pass a minute expressing uh, the, the desire in favor of granting you three years leave of absence from BMS so that you will understand that at the end of this period, the way is open for you to approach us again and to resume your missionary services. Well, at Hong Kong U, Gordon King was now a non-missionary, yet with a strong Christian vision. He made it clear to the BMS that Hong Kong U allowed him no capacity uh, to stay as a member of BMS, yet he kept his promises that he did not drop Christian ministry and should do and, and should any occasion might arise. He reports as the follow. I put up the quotation here. There are many opportunities among students and there is fairly Christian, uh, there is a fairly active Christian association here of which I have been selected president this year, 1940. There's a service every Sunday morning in one of the hostel chapels attended by 30 to 40 students. Next Sunday, this is Easter Sunday, I'm speaking at the, uh, Mary and I have been holding a discussion group recently on Sunday evenings at our house and have had about a dozen quite keen students attending. So there are many opportunities for services here. And in many respects, the work is no easier and no harder than it used to be in Chilu. But what did he actually do in Hong Kong? He was kept extremely busy. He was a professor of gynology. He took care of the maternity service. Uh, from the numbers you would see here, uh, he, he, had, he was extremely busy uh, with uh, medical uh, services. At the same time, uh, subsequently, he was appointed the Dean of Medicine that came with a lot of um, duties. Um, outside of Hong Kong U, 
he was um, the chairman of the Hong Kong uh, Unetics. Uh, under his term of chairmanship, he was more concerned with both birth control and infant care, targeting not on racial or ideological debates, but on the elimination of untold sufferings to both mothers and children. As such, his energy and time was spent on professoral duties and professional activities. His time and energy for Christian duties were understandably limited. It could not have qualified any contri Christian contribution of significance to medicine in Hong Kong. The eventual invasion of Japan by the Japanese army in December 1941 was a turning point for Gordon King. By early 1942, he was one among the several few British who could be spared from forcing into internment camp. Uh, his duty was to care for university relief hospital. His prior experience with the Japanese in Chilu convinced, that, convinced that him that it was of no future to work with them in Hong Kong. He thus escaped from Hong Kong. By April 1922, 42, sorry, he reached the Chongheng and he, became, he began assisting his students uh, from Hong Kong U. To him, he attached great importance to three matters, relief money, uninterrupted medical education, and recognitions from both, or fighting recognitions from both British Medical Council and Hong Kong government. Gordon King convinced the, the British ambassador to China to support Hong Kong student with a financial schemes offering relief money and subsequently setting up loans so that his student while on exile or in exodus, you know, they could uh, uh, make the ends meet. Uninterrupted uh, medical education, he was able to discuss it directly with the Chinese Minister for Education, um, Chan Li Fu. Chan knew that King had good reputation at both Peking Medical Union College and Chilu University, where he had served for more than a decade. At last, there were altogether 140 Hong Kong new medical students who continued their medical training in four medical colleges, namely the National Shanghai Medical College, the National uh, Xia Yale in China College, the Medical Colleges of Chilu and Ningnan Universities. Of these four medical colleges, three were Christian colleges. The fourth colleges, the fourth college, however, appoint him. This is that the fourth uh, college, uh, the national, um, the national uh, Shanghai Medical College, appointed him the visiting professors. So his prior work as a medical missionary played a considerable, considerable role. role in making these connections possible with uh, these new visiting positions. He got tightly connected with all four medical colleges where Hong Kong medical students studied. It was particularly important when it came to a point he has to fight for the recognition from the British Medical Council. It was because students' records were burned by the Japanese and he had to uh, present and, and make the case that the colleges that they study are all grade A colleges under these unusual and emergency conditions. So hoping that the British Medical Council could consider these colleges offer uh, training equivalent to what they could have received uh, from Hong Kong, from Hong Kong before the war. And one of the key issue here is in order to convince the medical council, he had to make available all the necessary documentations for accreditation purposes. And his connections with all the four colleges, of course, make things easier. Besides, he was very diplomatic. He was able to convince uh, other uh, people in China to support his uh, appeal, uh, including the British ambassador to China, as well as some ministers in London. The final step for him was, of course, to get a recognition from the Hong Kong government, which he was able to do it. Well, let's see things from the other perspective. How about students? I give a reflection uh, from 
Dr. Ong, uh, Chuan B. Ong, um, a Malay Chinese, um, who was also a medical, Hong Kong medical student from 1940 to 1947, witnessing the unfolding of events and gained original insights about the life and times of Gordon King. At the outbreak of the Japanese invasion, Ong observed that, that Gordon King was the driving force in the organization of the care for the sick at the wounded. On their exodus to China, to free China, on together with some, Hong Kong, some other Hong Kong students traveling from Guangdong to Guangxi, and they met up Gordon King in Guilin. King asked them to stay with the Chinese Red Cross, which was under the directorship of Dr. Robert Lim. It was again a precious learning opportunity for them. Lim joined the Banking Union Medical College in 1924 and worked as a professor of physiology until 1937. King and Lim were the best. King knew that Lim was the best possible mentor in physiology. Another significant, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, students knew that um, King and Lim were colleagues at the Bucking Union, uh, Bucking Union Medical Colleges together. And other significant moment that on saw King's contribution was the time when Hong Kong needed restoring its medical services. On remarked that although the medical faculty was not yet functioning in 1946, he was able to gather together the medical graduates here trained and post them as medical officers. On observed in 1940. 1948, when China was in the height of the civil war, um, and I put the quote here, at one stage, all the clinical posts in the Kowloon Hospital were filled by graduates of the University of Hong Kong, many of whom had worked at and acquired considerable experience in medical missionaries uh, throughout China, missionary hospitals throughout China. In short, Gordon King showed the values, at least as to be seen from the uh, students' eyes, uh, that Gordon King's conveyed the values and meanings of compassions and compassions and connections in the development of medicine. Gordon King's core was medical education. In the first part of in the first part of his China career that is 1927 to 1938, the Christian character of his work was more explicit because he was a medical missionary working in a Christian medical colleges. In the second half of his China career, from 1939 to 1956, the Christian character was more implicit as he was a professor and the Dean of Medicine. Yet there were, yet these two parts of his career were connected. I would argue that his missionary career and his experience with the Japanese rule in Jinan had prepared him the right path to take while tackling the challenges caused by the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong. Of all Gordon King's contributions in China, I would consider that his determination in delivering uninterrupted medical education for Hong Kong students was most important. Perhaps he had already experienced the time at Chilu where a vacuum in medical education would inevitably delay the future growth. If Hong Kong lost several generations of medical students from 1941 to 1945, it could have created a big gap in medical services in reconstruction years between 1946 and early 1950s, when the medical services was under tremendous pressure as the population grew from 0 0.6 million to over 2 million. Well, Paul, this all <laughs> for my short uh, presentation. Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ben Kong. Uh, now, if you just stop sharing. Yes, yes. Great, thanks very much. So this is so far outside of my field of uh, expertise, to put it mildly, and out of my um, continent of expertise, that uh, I'm a bit at a, at a loss for uh, for how 
to pose questions. I, I, so I'm, I'm, I, I just open the floor uh, to folks. Perry, you, uh, you're a newcomer. Can we impose on you to um, pose a question? Let me uh, invite or you Scott? to here. Okay. Well, I, I should make it, I should stress that actually when I was uh, preparing for this lecture, I was trying to do a, uh, a second case so that uh, I, the audience would be better informed about other aspects of the Christian contributions to medicine. Um, but at last, you know, time was running out, I, I could not, you know, uh, put that into. Another uh, historical character that I would like to, to put into this uh, lecture would be Arthur Wu, Dr. Arthur Wu, <clears throat> who was uh, the grandson of a one of the first you know chinese pastors in china and and his father i mean uh, dr wu's father was also a graduate of the hong kong college of medicine for china for the chinese and uh, he uh he, he died because of uh, his involvement in the uh, in treating the the hong kong 19 hong kong 1894 plague uh so um Ava Wu was brought up with a very strong uh, sense of missionary zeal and uh, the commitment to medical uh, needs. And therefore, uh, after he finished his education, he, he studied uh, in, in UK and got qualified. And then he, for some time, taught at the Bucking, again, uh, the Bucking uh, Union Medical Colleges. Then he returned to Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, he uh, start a hospital uh, where it offers, you know, maternity services. And uh, I think the most critical uh, uh, point uh, was that because he was a Chinese and under the Japanese occupation, um, the Japanese were more willing to work with the Chinese and therefore uh, missionaries chose him and the Japanese approved of this uh, selection that he was to become the the, the hospital director and of that uh, Learn Missionary Society hospital uh, called you know, Alice Memorial and Nadaso Hospital. And it was a very important uh, hospital that, uh, keep, that, 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 that kept uh, ongoing uh, medical services and uh, uh, including the training of nurses and fill the gap, you know, because at that time during the Japanese occupation, the Japanese did not actually um, uh, uh, focus on the well-being of the people, and uh, so um, the mis medical, I mean the missionary hospital, they had to uh, look for resources to make all the ends meet, and uh, from donations and from all sorts of connections that's possible uh, to make the services ongoing, and it proved to be an extremely ser important services uh, that you know, uh, for those who for some reason they could not leave Hong Kong, they take and they look upon that hospital as a great source of comfort. And of course, uh, they will look for remedy when they run into uh, medical uh, conditions. So mm -hmm. um, that was a, a powerful, again, a powerful Christian te testimony, testimony. And I think that was more um, explicit. Whereas Gordon King, I consider his case is more implicit in Hong Kong. But I, what I'm trying to, to, to argue or what I'm trying to put up here uh, through the case of Gone King was that, you know, um, his rather implicit, you know, Christian character uh, was actually a result of years or, uh, or, or a decade of explicit missionary services. With that, he had the foundation, with that, he had connections. So there is implicit Christian character together with the circumstances that, you know, um, Hong Kong U medical students need to look for another place uh, 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 to continue their study, not to waste their, uh, their, their talents, not to waste their future. Um, and I think that implicit turns to become explicit. So I think I, I want to play with that, you know, explicit, implicit, you know, character of the religious character of a person, you know, um, but perhaps I did not, 
you know, conveyed it more carefully or more, 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 more clearly in my lecture. But this is something I, I would like to, to do, you know, to, to, to show that, you know, when one comes to, uh, to studying the history of uh, Christian missions or church history, uh, sometimes we tend to focus on the explicit stories or the stories that show the explicit character. Yet I still believe that, you know, the implicit, you know, character was important. Um, I would uh, recently, as uh, Paul has just mentioned in, in my introduction, um, I just completed a, a oral history project with about 20 some uh, Christian doctors uh, uh, and nurses. And there was a leading paradigm actually that they, the, the not, or a considerable number of um, doctors uh, in Hong Kong, practicing doctors, especially uh, the Christian doctors, they will look upon Gordon King as their source of inspiration, as a kind of a role model. And uh, uh, they would also like to, um, uh, how to say, they, they, they would also like to, um, not high, but, but they would like to also express their Christian character in a, implicit way uh, because uh, at one point, uh, for example, we interviewed uh, Dr. Kwok Yong Yun, Yun Kwok Yong, you know, one of the leading character now uh, under the COVID, you know, uh, 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 pandemic, yeah, one of the leading authority in Hong Kong. He was actually a leading uh, uh, medical researcher and doctor uh, at Hong Kong U uh, during the 2003 SARS. Dr. Yun, he himself was also a Christian, but he did not, and he does not, I think he will not want to uh, expose uh, too much about his Christian religion because he did not want that um, any patient would have a, would have a notion that um, you cure me, you, 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 you help me because you want me, you want to convert me. No, mm -hmm. you would rather uh, let the spirit of professionalism prevail, and uh, so that uh, the patients got killed, got healed, uh, got recovered, and if later on that patient realized that you know um, Doctor Yun is indeed a Christian, that he believed that Doctor Yun believed that is a, it turns out to be a more powerful Christian testimony, and I believe in some way that professionalism before the Christian character. Um, I had some remote connections with the example set up by Gordon King. And Gordon mm -hmm. King still remember uh, uh, vividly. And uh, there, there are several places, for example, the, the Medical Museum of Hong Kong, which is a private organization, um, uh, organized it, uh, and funded by a group of committed uh, practicing doctors. And uh, there is a lecture hall named after, you know, Gordon King. And there were several scholarship and, and awards, you know, named after Gordon King to, I, 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 I think, you know, that nearly 200 of, you know, medical students, they want to show their appreciation uh, and gratitude to the services that Gordon King had done for them. And I, I do not know, and I, I have not come across with any students direct, you know, uh, witness or direct testimony, uh, co uh, making a direct correlation that, you know, uh, they became Christians because of Gordon King. I have not come across with any of this direct testimony, but I believe that his example and his influence was there and Thank his you. contribution yeah. were appreciated. Thank you. Um, before we go to Alan and Peter, who, ha who have questions, um, Harry Nielsen asks in his question that he sent to me uh, via the chat, he wants to know about the uh, kind of the impact of Japanese persecution, um, if, if that happened in the Western, uh, in, in occupied territories. Uh, well, if that, if that had any influence in the way the, in the, way the medicine was, was um, expressed. Yes, um, the Gordon King were keen aware, and actually a few, actually uh, Lancy Wright, for example, uh, also of the medical uh, faculty at Hong Kong at that time, um, 
he was at first, you know, uh, uh, allowed out of the internment camp uh, to mm -hmm. continue with some uh, services. Uh, of course, you know, you can imagine after serious combating, you know, while the Japanese invading Hong Kong, you know, there was a, a strong demand in medical services and the Japanese could not take care of all the, you know, medical uh, services. So they would allow some uh, uh, Westerners, uh, the, the Western doctors to continue their practices. But soon, maybe less than half a year, then all Westerners are locked up, you know, in the internment camp. Because after all, the Japanese, uh, 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 the, 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 the slogan or the intention was to establish a East Asia, East Asia Coast Prosperity Spheres kicking out all the white uh, Westerners. And so, um, so all the whites, all the, uh, you know, uh, Anglo-Americans, you know, they were sent to the internment camps and some managed to escape from Hong Kong to free China, uh, to unoccupied, you know, China. And some fail, some, some fail and some succeed. And uh, of course, um, under the internment camp, there were different, you know, uh, stories. Uh, some had died there, some had developed depression, and some, you know, uh, remained robust and, you know, powerful, you know. So we come across of all sorts of stories. And, and uh, basically, I think expedience is the, the best description, you know, for the Japanese uh, 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 to explain the Japanese actions and, and ideas, uh, to explain the, the Japanese actions. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the, 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 the questions. Um, Thank you. I, I'm sorry, Paul. Oh, it's okay, um, Alan and then Peter. Oh, I think Scott. Um, do we have to unmute you? Hang on. Sorry, for okay. precautionary here with our security okay. setting. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. Uh, yes, I can hear you. You you mentioned early in your talk that. Um, there was a revival of interest in traditional Chinese medicine as early as the 1920s or 30s. And of course, one aspect of traditional Chinese medicine that has now won quite a large degree of acceptance in the West is acupuncture. But uh, we didn't become aware of it until uh, well after the People's Republic was established so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the history of the revival of interest in China in traditional Chinese medicine. Thank you, Alan. Um, this is a very challenging question. Um, um, I think um, it is, well, perhaps I did not make myself clear enough. Um, Chinese medicine during the 1920s, uh, from the 20s to 40s or before the PRC uh, was a kind of a mixed, uh, was in a kind of a mixed position. Uh, some would like to develop further the Chinese uh, medicine as an expression of nationalism, as a strong uh, Chinese identity. And they believe that, um, for example, uh, the mission missionaries, they, um, they recognize and acknowledge the profound richness of the material medica traditions in China. And the Chinese wisdoms contained in the herbal medicine uh, was duly acknowledged. So for this reason, uh, medical missionaries starting from the 1830s on for another century, they rarely touch on the herbal medicine. And when you talk about uh, acupuncture, yes, um, it was only revived after uh, after the PLC, and uh, uh, the and it was uh, more or less a kind of a, a, a result of the policy level decision uh, from the uh, government, you know, and uh, because it it could be dangerous, you know, uh, of some intrusion. Uh, 
uh, using the needle and etc. You know, so um, it requires uh, some uh, what is the, the supervisions and, and management, and um, I that's that's the case. But on the other hand, um, we come across with uh, powerful people like uh, Wu Lende, who was who had that wonderful and beautiful success in fighting the Manchuria plate, and he personified the power of modern biomedicine. So uh, some progressive intellectuals, if progressive is a, a right word, okay, um, that they would consider that, you know, in order to quest for modernity, uh, we need to, uh, you know, embrace biomedicine. And in the same logic, you know, Chinese medicine should also fall into this uh, uh, paradigm in order to uh, become a project of modernity as well. But um, it's a, a very complicated uh, enterprise, you know, when we talk about Chinese medicine, because there are some family traditions, there are different school of thoughts, there are uh, all kinds of uh, different practices. So it's, it's never easy to, uh, to, to do it. And I think after the PRC, you know, uh, when it come to power and, and it, it come to Chinese medicine and and they make a very clear directive to uh, include in to 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 try to uh, mix and match and to combine uh, the more medicine with the Chinese medicine and that's the beginning of what we now see the the popular you know Chinese medicine uh, that we, we see nowadays. Thanks, Mai Kong. Uh, Peter. Yeah, thank you for this really detailed work. I have uh, an idea of some Chinese history and some Hong Kong history. And I'm wondering how these medical professionals fit within the broader British professional, uh, I don't wanna call them elite necessarily, but within Hong Kong society before 1937, were the, did the physicians stand out or were the university professors standing out or military British military officers? So the, were, were the Christian doctors among lots of British Christians or were they alone as British and Christian within Hong Kong? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think um, in Hong Kong, there were a lot of arrogant people and they were uh, adventure, adventurous. So for the businessmen, they thought they could lobby the British politicians in London and to make policy in favor of their business. So they thought of themselves highly. Um, the military officers similarly thought of themselves very highly. Without them, they thought uh, the Japanese or the Chinese could easily took over Hong Kong. So without them, Hong Kong was nothing. So of course they were very arrogant missionaries or the, uh, well, I would say that um, they had a particularly strong uh, professionalism um, in a way that um, perhaps you have heard about a person called Patrick Manson. We call them the father of tropical disease. Mm -hmm. He was a hero in, uh, uh, while uh, he was a hero, uh, a, a few defining uh, physicians, uh, uh, in the field of germ theories, he um, he was um, he was uh, the first persons to unlock the mystery of elephant elephantiasis, oh. and later on, his with his insights, um, uh, he helped solve the problem of malaria. So you know, uh, Patrick Manson, for example, uh, he was indeed working. Uh, in the Chinese customs for nearly 20 years. And then he moved to Hong Kong because he believed that the business person and the military person, they would pay a lot of money to see the doctor. So, um, and, and then he started his business here, but he uh. did not lose sight of the white man burden. So he started the Hong Kong College of Medicine. So um, he has become a kind of a towering figure. People look upon him and therefore it has become a, a very uh, prestigious uh, model. Uh, many practitioners of Western medicine, they believe that 
they were the Patrick Manson, the second, the fourth, the fifth, <laughs> etc. And nowadays, yeah. um, if you look into the Hong Kong U website, they would they would celebrate um, several historical figures. Of course, Dr. Sanya Sen, it goes without saying for political reasons. Uh, but Patrick Manson, definitely a a very clear model. So in that regard, um, they they ha they hold themselves in an extremely high esteem. They thought they were at the forefront of the medical field, and they would command instant respect. You know, and uh, and uh, while the growth of the empire, uh, tropical medicine was a major field. At first, of course, among the British, and later on, even when the Japanese they started the empire, they also joined the, the enterprise of tropical medicine because starting from 1895, when they occupied Taiwan, and later on in the 1930s, they start their aggression in Southeast Asia. They come across with entirely different geographical locations. In Japan, you know, it's a little bit, uh, locate, locate a little bit northward. Uh, whereas when, he started, when they started uh, their empire in Taiwan and Southeast Asia, this tropical area, and tropical disease was certainly something that they consider uh, very new. So the Japanese also attach great importance to tropical medicine. So as such, you know, um, Hong Kong uh, practitioners, they consider themselves very highly uh, because of their potential contributions to, to this field of knowledge. At the same time, I believe that um, they, they always consider themselves um, very um, successful because um, I think uh, um, uh, I, Give an example and a quote. Um, uh, Doctor On, he was actually a Malay Chinese, and by the way, there were quite a number of Malay talents. They chose to study medicine at Hong Kong U uh, because they believed that Hong Kong U's uh, medical faculty uh, was the best in Asia. So, um, so there are many reasons to buttress their confidence, and and but um, deep down in their heart. All of them consider themselves better than others. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Peter. That's a very good question. And thanks very much, Aman Kong. I think we'll have to wrap it up. We're just at about six. Maybe Scott. So please join me in, in thanking Man Kong Wong. It's a little bit hard to have a proper uh, round of applause on Zoom, but I think you get the you get the sense that people have really appreciated the, the amount of Thank detail you. that you've provided. So thanks very much for that. And it's, it's a shame we don't have you around here on a sort of ordinary day-to-day -day basis because I'd, I'd love to- Oh, that's um, my problem. I, yeah. Because of the Hong Kong government's quarantine policy, yeah. <laughs> it would be very troublesome for me to return to Hong Kong. So, right. so I'll, thank you for giving this opportunity to do that online. Thank you. Well, and we, and we look forward to uh, you coming here in the future once, the, once COVID Definitely. is just, uh, just a Definitely. medical memory. Definitely. Thank you. So um, the slide on the screen that you can see right now uh, gives you a sense of what's going to happen next week. Um, Gray McDonough will offer how supersessionism instructs the Catholic Church's approach to reconciliation. Uh, so we'll be back in the Elliott building next week at uh, five. So sorry, not next week, pardon me. Next week is actually reading week. Uh, thanks very much, Scott, for waving. Uh, so next week we take a break and then the week after we're, uh, we get a chance to hear about Graham's work, work on supersessionism. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. And thanks uh, one last time, and Kong Wong. And uh, see you in person one day soon, I hope. Take care, everybody. Thank you.